let me okay, just set things up. Okay, great. I hope you are able to see my screen. Can someone confirm that? Okay, excellent. Okay. So before moving ahead, uh, let, let me uh, quickly summarize what we did in yesterday's class. So in yesterday's class, we we'll, we finished our uh, exploration of pandas. Uh, we saw how using pandas we can access a, a, a data set like movie lens. And additionally, we did lots of operations within the movie lens data set which included looking at some plotting aspects, trying to understand what the plot looks like, trying to describe the plot. We also uh, tried different booleans and filters, uh, tried different filters where we said, is the movie is highly rated or not, or is the movie is comedy or animation. We tried exploring the group by function. The group by function was basically uh, aggregating uh, information from different columns together and we saw how to manipulate that to to find the count or to find the mean we also saw methods of merging multiple data frames together so uh, in the last example we actually merged the two data frames which were the movies data frame and then the the ratings data frame to form something called as a box office we saw uh, if, if, even within the plotting we saw different kinds of plots like histograms and bar charts and yeah I guess those were the two different kinds of plots we saw. Today in this class uh, we are moving to another package of data science it is called matplotlib. Matplotlib is a very famous uh, visualization uh, package within pandas and we'll be exploring here matplotlib to see how we can generate different kinds of interesting plots. Okay. So uh, in the beginning we uh, one side note that for matplotlib to run within Jupyter Notebook, you have to write this command that is a percentage followed by matplotlib space and then inline. What this ensures is this ensures that we are printing, uh, this ensures that we, the plots that we create with matplotlib will be showed within the code section or after the code section of your Jupyter Notebook. So here, let me delete this one line. Okay, let me skip this. So we import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. So within the matplotlib category, there is something called as Python plots, pyplots, and we import it as plt. plt is the standard name, short form alias that is used for matplotlib. You, of course, you can use something else, but I would highly recommend you use the same as I'm showing here because that is the standard that most people use. We also import NumPy as NP so that we can get uh, the data that we can plot with. Now, within all plots of, of matplotlib, uh, there is something called as a figure and there's something called as axis. Okay. These we can create manually or this can be automatically created by matplotlib in the background. Uh, first, we'll see how we can do it manually, right? So you write the command. So plt was the short form for the package that we loaded with. We write plt.figure. We store that as fig fig. And plt.axis, we store that in ax. Now these two are accessible to us and we can do things with that. You see, even when we write the, or we execute this with an empty, we don't even give the data. It shows us, uh, within a figure, it shows us an axis on which the data can be plotted. Okay, so let us try to populate this and see how this works out. So in this case, I'm creating X and Y by using this data. So here uh, within NumPy, there is this one more interesting function called as linspace. And what linspace does is it takes three arguments. The first argument is the starting point. The next argument is the ending point. And the third argument is from starting to ending, how many points do we need? How many points do we want? So when I write here x is equal to np length space 0, 10, 100, then from 0 to 10, it creates 100 points. So let me quickly show you what that looks like. When I execute this, I can see from 0 
200, the 0 to 10, there are 100 points. Can you tell me how I can use the same thing? How can get the same result, but by using A range? Okay, so A range is our uh, A range is our uh, function that we've used, which is the NumPy version of range, which takes start point, end point, and step size. What should be the start point, end point, and step size so that we get this answer? Okay, 1, 10, and point 0.1. Let's try that. If you write, sorry, 0, 10, point 0.1, and then we write x and execute this, we get 0 to 9.9. .9. We don't reach till 10, that is first. And our, how, many, how many points are these? So let me do length of x, or I can simply do x dot shape. And say, okay, we are 100 points. That's fine, we are 100 points, but we are not reached the end point as one. Uh, other option is, some people are saying 11. 11 will take you to 10.9, right? It will not take you there. So what we need to do here is, I would say my step size should be 10 divided by 99. This will be plus 10 by 99. Okay, let me execute this one. Okay, so this gives me exactly how many points? This gives me exactly 100 points, which are from zero to 10. Okay. So I just said that, okay, I need uh, divide that into 99 points and then additionally take one point extra from here. Okay. So that gives me my same idea as lint space. Anyways, this was just a sidetrack. Let's forget that here. Lin space start from zero, go till 10 in 100 points. So that is our X data. That is our information on the X axis. Okay. On the Y axis, I want to plot a sine curve. So I can just say NP dot sine of X. That is from NumPy. We are calling the trigonometric function sine and we are passing that X. So that is our Y axis. Earlier within this code, we wrote two things. We created the figure we created the axis and on this axis we are plotting so you write ax ax dot plot okay ax dot plot and you provide the two inputs the first input is the x-axis uh, values the second input is the y-axis values so when i execute this we can see that we get a we get a sign here okay. fairly simple uh, we also see that it creates a line plot what's the line plot a line plot is this thing where uh, even though we are giving individual points, what uh, matplotlib does, it, it connects those individual points uh, using a single line. Okay, that's called a line plot. And now we can see the line plot for this. Uh, if I want to see further, let's say, uh, instead of 0 to 10, I want to see 0 to 20. I will just change this to 0 to 20. And I execute this. So now we see a longer time frame. And since the number of points have not changed, this looks not a lot smooth. You see on the top uh, end, it's not very smooth. Let me reduce the number of points even further. Maybe let's say just 50 points and execute this. We can see now breaks definitely, right? Let me take it back to 10 and 25. So, okay. so when you create with less number of points, your line plot uh, will start to get uh, but see, uh, piecewise, that is, it will be from here to here, just connects through one piece and so on. But now we have seen how we can use a line plot. It's very simple. We write ax dot plot. That is on the axis. We plot with the x and y data. Okay. Now we can do the same thing by using plt dot plot. And the advantage is when we use plt dot plot in the background, it automatically creates for us the figure and axis. Uh, sadly, we don't have access to them. But uh, this is a shorter command. You write plt.plot and you write your command, okay? X and Y. I'm using the same data. Let's execute. We're getting the same answer as before. Now, 
we can do some more things. If I want to get multiple plots, so in this case, I'm getting two plots, PLT uh, X and sine X, X and cosine X. In fact, let me go back. Let me increase the number of points again so that we get some better plots. Okay. So we can get our sine curve, which is this blue line, and we can get a cosine curve, which is this orange line. Uh, you may see that interestingly, uh, uh, Matplotlib has done some things. It has, first we did not specify any colors to them. So Matplotlib has automatically decided that the first waveform will be blue, bluish. The second waveform will be orangish, which is very good for defaults. Of course we can change them, but I, I think I like the defaults here so that I can know that these are actually two different curves. Uh, let's go ahead. Further, we would be interested to see how we can change the colors and how we can change the line style. Okay. So to experiment with colors, there are many ways within matplotlib to define colors. Uh, just so that we can see all of them in one plot, I'm modifying the data a little bit. The first case I'm using X as for all the plots, X is on the X axis. For y axis, we have different terms. So when we say np numpy dot sine x minus zero, that is simply sine x. That is the first one here. Followed that is x minus one. So we have uh, a graph which is shifted within the time so that we get a different curve like this. So you get x minus one, this is x minus two, x minus three, x minus four, x minus five. And then this one is again the first one. Okay. So we have taken the entire space and divided it into multiple parts. So that we have different plots, we can verify the colors easily. Okay. Uh, now to define the color, along with first argument and second argument, we are defining a third argument called as color. So we're using this as a keyword argument. That means we are giving the keyword color is equal to, and then we give some code. Now within Python uh, and within Matplotlib, it expects it accepts uh, different uh, styles of writing color. First style is we can just write the name of the color. So we write blue here and it understands that what is blue and it prints the blue one. We can write the color in the form of short code. That is the short codes can be taken from these uh, characters R, G, B, C, M, Y, K. So R stands for red, G, green, B, blue. Any guess what C stands for? You're right. C for cyan, M for magenta, Y for yellow, and interestingly, K for black. Okay. So these are the short code colors that we have. So G is green. Let me try cyan. If I write C for cyan, change. You can see the second curve has changed its color to cyan. Let me show you magenta. This is magenta. And then let me show you K for black. So we can change the color by using the short code. We can give long code. So here, instead of blue, if I go for something like uh, red, you can see it has changed to red. Okay. Let me change back to the old ones. It was blue. This was green. That's, okay. That's the first two ways of defining colors. The third way is we can actually give a grayscale number between 0 and 1. Okay. So 0.5 will be gray. Let me show you what zero does. If you put zero and execute, you can see the third line. Zero means full black. In that context, one would mean full white. So and I execute that, you see, there is this, you can just see the breaks, so you cannot see the curve. This is the white plot because a background is also white. And anywhere in between, let's say 0.7, will be more towards white, less towards gray. 0.2 would be more towards black, Let's towards white and so on. So we can control the intensity of grayscale by using these numbers between zero to one. The fourth way is writing the hex code for the color. Hex code for the color is basically uh, uh, we are defining R component of R component of G and component of B for defining the color. So this gives us lot many more options. So, so far we have seen blue limited limited options of colors again limited options of colors 
this intensity only within grayscale. But now we are exploring that we can come to actually infinite combinations of not infinite, but a very large combination of colors here. So in fact, I think I had a color to go. Let me quickly check. So I have a, uh, an extension on my browser, the color picker. I hope you're able to see this. So as I take my, as I take my mouse pointer to different sections of the code, uh, you can see that it has a, a hash uh, uh, and within the text box, it gives me the, the hex code for the color, right? So right now I'm pointing in a white section. So it is showing all FF, FF, which means that I'm looking at the color white. Let me show you if I take it to this bluish color, it gives me the hex code as 3B40FF. So what this means is I have 3B percentage. So 3B is the hex number, which translates to 59. So as given down, that is from zero to 255, 59 component of red, 40 stands for 64 component of green, and FF, which is uh, 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 255 component of blue. So the first two characters hex stands for red component, second two characters for green component and next two for blue component, okay? So this is what I'm trying to explain. What is hex code? So hex code is uh, a number system in which uh, your, your base is of 16 digits. So let's say we use the decimal system. So decimal system, your base is of 10 digits. The 10 digits we use is 0 to 9, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. In a hexadecimal number system, your base is 16. So if we use 16 different characters or 16 different uh, values to represent a number. The 16 values are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That is our normal like decimal. The 10th value is A, 11th is B, 12th is C, uh, 13th is D, 14th is E and 15th is uh, F. So that is zero to F, you have 16 different characters. That is a hexadecimal system. So here, as you see, as I move my mouse pointer to different sections, I can see different combinations of hexadecimal. So here, yes, it says we can create, yes. So basically here, now you can create uh, like so many different combinations of colors that you want. Let me show you a few. So let's say, this is the fourth graph. This is the yellowish color that I'm trying to plot. So here I'm saying FF component of red, DD component of green and BB component of blue. Let's say within this, I want to increase the bluish shade. I take it to some high number like say F0. And when I execute this, okay, RGB F0. let me make it full FF. So actually there is, full red also. So red and this much blue is making this pinkish shade. Let me reduce the value of red to zero. Okay, you see that now we have gone to a bluish shade. This looks more greenish also because we have DD component of green. If I reduce this DD component of green to maybe 10, I will have low component of green, more of blue. So this looks bluish. Okay. So these are different ways where you can define color. In fact, let me show you. Okay. Uh, so I generally people don't guess hex codes like this. You would actually come to a color picker like this. You will choose a color. So let's say I want maybe this shade. I can move this pointer to maybe let's say this is the color that I want. I can see that this color corresponds to this hex code, which is 8A318F. I copy this hex code, take it to my screen, paste here, and execute. You can see this is the color that we have found here. Okay. So this basically says that you have so many different options now. You can just go to a color picker like this, choose a base color, and within that base color, try to find what is the option you want. Let's say I want this, which is this code. Copy the code, bring it to your notebook. Replace this, execute. Okay, so you find that color. So that way you can actually have very fine tuned control over what color you're printing. The next way is if you don't like hex codes, 
you can try this next option, which is again RGB. So the first year we are now we are passing a tuple of three values. The first value corresponds to R next to G next to B, which stands for red, green and blue. And we can give a number between zero and one that represents how much percentage we want. Okay. So here we have 100% of red, 20% uh, of green and 30% of 30% uh, of blue, okay, which gives us this red color because we have 100% of red. That is again another way of defining color. And finally, we can use all HTML color names supported. So if you are a programmer, uh, uh, a web developer who uses HTML, CSS and stuff like that, you may be more familiar with these words where you can directly choose the name of a color. So here we have something like chart reuse, which gives this fluorescent kind of color. So several ways of defining colors. I generally uh, use either the first one or the second one because most of my plots are done within this. In fact, when we go to Seaborn, uh, we'll see a totally different way of defining colors, which is more interesting and that reduces our task, uh, uh, makes our task a little bit more easier. Let's go down. Along with color, we can also change the line style. So here for the data, I'm using X uh, and X itself, but the second X here, on the X axis, we have all the same components. Plus on the Y axis, I'm just using X plus zero, X plus one, X plus two. That will give us this shifted curves, okay? So this is the first line, which is here X and X plus zero, which is uh, as, as X increases, this uh, Y also is the same increase X. So we go to zero to 10 here, and we go to zero to 10 here for the first line. Okay, so the first line, we are saying that we want a line style of solid. So line style of solid is basically this continuous line. Then we have a line style of dashed. You see the second orange one. This is having a dashed line style. So first you should also notice that we are not defining any colors here. Uh, what matplotlib is doing is automatically changing the colors based on an internal format. So that is, these will be the colors that will automatically happen as you uh, continue to uh, write or plot separate things into this code. So we see dash, sorry, solid, we dashed, we saw dash, then there is dash dot, which gives you this dash dot kind of patterns, followed by dotted. So here this red line is all dotted. Now, instead of writing text like this, we could also use short quotes. So if you write a simple hyphen, that simple hyphen stands for solid. If you write two hyphens, that stands for dashed. If you write a hyphen and a period, hyphen and a dot, that gives you this dash dot. And then when you write a colon like this, you get dotted. Okay. Several ways of controlling line style, several ways of controlling color. And of course we can combine the two together. So this is a combination of solid green. So you have a single hyphen and G which stands for green. That is why we got this plot. Then we can have a dashed cyan that is two hyphens and a C which gives us the cyan. Dash dot K is dash dot black. And then semicolon R is dotted red. Okay. So we can combine line styles, we can combine colors. So we have some more control over our plots. Let's go deeper. Let's see other things that we can do with our matplotlib. So we can also control the X limit and Y limit. So uh, we're using the same plot as before, that is X and NP dot sin X to give this curve. But we can see that this is not the entire sine curve. In fact, we have limited how much we will be plotting on the X axis and how much we'll be plotting on the Y axis. Okay. So here X limit takes two inputs. The first one tells you, where do you start the X axis? Second one tells you, where do you end the X axis? So we start the X axis at minus 0.5. That is why you see here, we start at minus 0.5. We end at 3.5. So we end at 3.5. That is the X limit. Similarly, we use the Y limit. So we are going from minus 0.1, minus 0.1 to 1.1 to 1.1. Okay. So we can control X and Y. Let's go ahead. We can use this interestingly to even reverse or shift the axis. Okay. So what does that mean? You see here X limit. Now we are saying go from 10 to zero. Normally on the X axis, you want to go from a lower number to a positive number. Okay. 
but sometimes we would want to shift our plots also or we would want to flip our plots also and especially in data science we do that a uh, lot of times uh, especially with uh, bar charts and things like that uh, the purpose is we want to use we want to show many things in one plot so sometimes we have to flip our plots so that we can uh, uh, we can show contrast or we can show uh, uh, comparison or have a more visual effect and so on within python we can within matplotlib we can do that simply by using xlim so you give 10 to 0 so you see their x limit starts from 10 it ends at 0 we and y lim we have shifted our y limit also from 1.2 to minus 1.2 so the negative here starts at minus 1 oh, sorry 1.2 followed by uh, you know keep on going here till minus 1.2 as well let's go ahead uh, apart from x lim and y lim we have a function called as access and to this access, we can provide a, a list of items. And this lists are basically this x min x max, y min y max. So in one go, you can define the limits on your x axis and your y axis. So here we are saying start from on the x axis, start from minus one and go till 11. So here we start from minus one and go till 11. And similarly, uh, on the y axis, we are saying start from minus 1.5 and go till 1.5. We start from minus 1.5 and go to 1.5. Okay. In access, apart from lists, we can also give words. Okay. And these words have inbuilt meanings within, within uh, matplotlib. So we can give the word tight. And what it does, it, it tightens the border on all four sides. It plots everything that you want to show, but it tightens all. So we, when you say tight, it goes from zero to a little bit ahead from zero and 10. So it gives us, uh, it gives us some more uh, control over what we try to plot. Okay. Okay. Please go slow. <laughs> sure. I, I'll try to go slow. Okay. So uh, you're unable to type. Why are you typing? I, you should just view this uh, and uh, I have already provided this. Uh, I have already provided the notebooks. Okay, you can practice on your own time, so that I can complete my class. You can practice on the notebook uh, later on. We don't have to slow down here because these are really simple things. Okay, so here we are saying uh, using the plt dot axis and tight. Okay, so that gives us a tighter layout. Let me show other things. Apart from tight, we can use something like equal. And what equal does is it uses the same scaling on the X axis and the same scaling on the Y axis. Okay. So what do I mean by that? So uh, let's look at this example. Okay. So here uh, we are plotting 10 units of those 10 units. Uh, let's say this much is two units. Okay. Zero to two. Zero to two is this much size. Similarly, you could see that minus one to one, which covers our plot is also of two units. Okay. So axis equal ensures that your X axis scaling and your Y axis scaling is the same. Okay. And there may be some advantages or depending upon our use case, that would be something that we want to do and we can follow something like that. Let's go ahead. So we saw how to control our plots. We can also label our plot. So many of times without the label, it becomes difficult to understand. So we can provide. So here we are showing an, I'm showing an example when I'm plotting the same curve as before the N, the X and NP dot sine X. And now we can control the title. So I'm writing the title here, which is a sine curve, which gets printed. We can write the X label, which is X comes on the bottom here. We can write a Y label, which comes here. And we can also see the Y label is uh, they have, Pyplot, matplotlib automatically uh, tilts your y axis so that it looks more natural. So that way we can control title, x label, y label. Let's go ahead. Uh, additionally, we would want to give a legend sometimes. Okay. So a legend is basically this small chart which tells us, which gives us a demo of the plot style here and it gives us, it provides a name. So to do something like that, we have to start with 
when we are defining the plot, that is in this case, we are defining the plot x sin x with a solid green. We have to define the label that you would want to come in the legend. So here we are defining the label as sin x. For the second plot, we are defining the label as cos x. And after you finish plotting, you have to write the command plt.legend. When you write plt.legend, it will take a sample of this line style and color and will assign this name here. So when I execute this, you can do this. I can also change the, this can be any string that you want. Okay. I can have curve one and curve two as well. And that will also work fine. Okay. So we execute this. We have curve one and curve two showing here. So this could represent uh, so many things and it makes your chart more easier or uh, readable for your users. Let's go ahead. Now we saw uh, PLT was one way of accessing stuff and acts as another way of accessing stuff. So earlier in the initial part, I showed you that uh, we can create a figure and an axis and we can plot using ax.plot. And the shortcut was not using AX, but directly using PLT. Sometimes we would want to use AX as well. And in those cases, we should remember, or we should see that there are certain uh, options which are have changed. Okay. That is for X label, we would use PLT.X label. Uh, but when you're using the AX command, you would use AX.set underscore X label. And this would do the corresponding task of setting the label here. Let me show you a few examples. Here I'm creating an axis by writing plt.axis, that is your ax here. ax.plot will plot a line plot with x and uh, y data as np.sin x. And now uh, I am trying to use the set command to set multiple options here. Okay. So maybe first let me show you a case where this is our base plot. So let me execute this. This is our base plot. Now if I want to add the x label, if I write ax.x label, it will give me an error as we just saw. It says that this ax subplot object has no attribute x label. So instead of x label, we have to use set x label. So I can write set underscore x label and execute this. That gives me this x label here. I could use for y label, I could use set y label as sign of x and set title as a sign curve. Okay, so those would be the corresponding ways of doing things in AX mode. Additionally, uh, AX has, or this uh, AXIS plot has a function called as set, which will allow us to do multiple things in one go. So you can write AX, AX dot set, you can write X -lim. So we're saying, okay, my X limit should go from zero to 10, Y -lim. It should go from minus two to two. X label should be X. Y label should be sine X. And title is simple plot. Okay. So the set command helps us to do multiple things in one go. Okay. So we have seen simple plots. Uh, sorry, we have seen line plots, and we have seen several ways of controlling our plots. Let's go a bit deeper. Another kind of plot is something called a scatter plot. Okay, and scatter plots are basically. Not uh, like line plots, what it will do is it will take your individual data points and connect them together. Whereas scatter plots would keep them separate. Okay, each data point looks like a separate point on the plot. It does not join. Now there are several ways of creating scatter plots. We are first seeing a way where we can use the same command as before, the plot function. We saw that the plot function was used for line plots. Now we are seeing that the plot function can also be used for scatter plots by making a small twist. The twist is uh, the plotting style will provide an object. Okay, so let me show you an example. Here I'm creating uh, the x axis, which is saying go from 0 to 10, but instead of 100 points, just keep 30 points so that we can see these points separately. So using 30 points, we'll create our x axis. Y axis is the same as before, that is sine x. Now, when we plot this, we are using a notation like this O. So when you use O, what it does it, it fills with this filled circles and the color of these circles is black. If you want to change the color, I can take it to red. This, if I want to change this style, instead of a O, I can use plus. And now I have these cross marks here, okay? So depending on what we want, we can plot this. So the next logical question would be, 
how many of these objects are there and what all things can be put here. For this, let me show you this example. Uh, in this example, what I'm doing is I'm randomly generating some data and plotting it randomly, giving an X coordinate, a Y coordinate and choosing uh, five points for each data. And for each five points, I'm providing some marker here. Okay. The purpose is to see what are the different kinds of objects we can use for scatter plots. Okay. So uh, NP dot random dot random state zero is my random number generator RNG. And I'm creating a figure of fig size 10 comma five. So that is 10 units on the X axis, five units on the Y axis. So this is just units means how the shop will be, uh, how the plot will be shaped, not the values on the plot. Okay. So that's why you can see this is a rectangular, more horizontal and half of that is vertical. I'm writing a for loop for each of these points. Okay. So for marker in these points, I'm using an O dot comma X plus V hat less than greater than S and D. Okay. These are the markers that I'm going for. For each marker, write this command. So this command is basically a plot. It says random from my random number generator, create random five points for the X axis, create random five points for the Y axis. My marker will come from the for loop marker here. And I'm also writing a label that will help me to generate uh, this part here. When we generate this part, then we can do plt.legend and we'll get the plot here. Okay. So for the label, we are using a string maker or a, a dynamically generated string which says marker is equal to and this part. Okay. So what this part basically means that this is this is a dynamic value which has to be changed from what we put here in the marker. So to the string, when we do a dot format and you write marker. So this is the zero, the first input. So in Python first is basically index zero. The index zero element will be printed up here. Okay, that is what this means. So once we execute this, you can see that I have several plots, uh, several scattered points, and we have examples of O. So O gives you a marker like this, a filled circle. Uh, dot gives you this one, so a smaller one. A comma gives you an even smaller dot. X gives you this cross plus plus. V gives you this lower triangle, lower pointing triangle. Up gives you this upper pointing triangle. Uh, less than, sorry, no, this is not up, this is hat. Okay, this hat is available on top of your uh, number six. So when you press shift and six, you will get this symbol. Then we have less than greater than, which makes your left pointing and right pointing triangle. S gives you a square. D gives you a diamond shape. Okay. So those are the objects. There are many more, but I'm limiting it to this. And so that we see all these point shift. We can also combine scatter plots and line plots. So here uh, for the same X and Y, okay, let me execute this. For X and Y, I'm giving this line style. So what is this line style? This is saying first dash stands for solid, O stands for the marker, and K stands for the color, black. So that is why we get a, we get a solid line. And at our points, we also have uh, these markers dots. And all of this is in the, in the color K. Okay. Now we would be interested to see, can I control the different aspects of this line and the different aspects of this marker? So I'm using the same X and Y, but now I'm using a dash and a P. What is a dash and a P? So dash stands for this line. P stands for, okay, you're right. I got uh, in a comment, Pentagon, excellent. P stands for Pentagon. Okay. Now these are the different parameters. We can control everything. So when you say color G, this G gives the green color to the line. Okay. If I want to make it, let's say blue, I will write B and execute. You can see that our color of the line has changed to blue. Then things with marker, right? So I can change the marker. Marker size 10 gives me this big pentagons. I can make the marker size smaller. Let's say, I put marker size five and execute. I can see now that I have a smaller marker size. Okay, let me make it 20. You will get a bigger marker size. Let me take it back to 10. Okay, 
So by controlling marker size, we can control marker size, of course. Uh, line width, so the line, uh, blue, the blue line, solid line, we can control its width by, by changing the line width. So now it is five. Let me change that to two, execute. You can see this line has become much thinner. You can control the marker face color. So this marker face color, you see the inside color within the marker that is blue here. We can change that to a different color. So let me change that to maybe red. And you can see that the inside color, the face color of the marker has changed to red. We can control the marker edge color. So right now it is orange edge color. Let me change that to maybe green. So the edge color has become green. We can also change the marker edge width. So now this is very thick. It is five. Let me change that to two. You can see that the edge becomes smaller. So here, uh, interestingly, we can control many different aspects of our plot by using this. Uh, what happens when we change to white? It will become white. But sadly, or interestingly, since our background is also white, we will not be able to see much. Let me change the marker face color to white. So instead of red, I put a white here and execute. You can see that the inside color has become white. Now. Okay. But if you change this line color to white, this W for white, I'm not sure. Yes. Then, uh, you know, it is as good as not plotting a line, especially with the background as white. If you change your background to a different color, which we can change, but let me talk about that later on. If you change your background color to black or a darker color, then you can see white over it. So let me change this to blue. Uh, let me change this white to red again. Okay. So we can control several aspects of these plots. Uh, the, the interesting thing is you can see as we change one value, all of the different points follow the same, follow the same strategy. So when you put marker size of 10, all these markers, all these different points will all have the size 10, which is fine for tasks like this, but sometimes we would want that we could control each and every point. Okay. So for that, uh, we will go to a different kind of plot. So right now we were using the line plot and using the line plot, we are getting a scattered plot, but we have a special function called as a scattered, which is more tuned to what we want here. So here I'm just using the same data plt dot scatter instead of plot. I've changed the function to scatter and providing X, Y and marker. So when I execute this, we get X, Y, and O. Let's go down. And here I'm showing you a different example where I have a random number generator, RNG. To this random number generator, I'm creating X and Y. So I'm creating normally distributed 10 points for the X axis, normally distributed 10 points for the Y axis. I have defined a variable called as colors, which I am also generating randomly generated 10 points. And I have a variable called sizes, which I'm saying randomly generated 10 points multiplied by thousands so that I get bigger sizes. And now I'm calling this command plt.scatter. Okay, let me erase this. I'm calling this command plt.scatter. X and Y are these randomly generated points, X, Y. Now C defines our color. Okay, so we write C is equal to colors. This colors is the variable here. So this colors variable is also just random points, okay? Uh, let me do a print of colors so that we get an idea and let me also do a print of sizes so we get an idea. So C is equal to colors. S, we are saying S controls the size. We are providing the variable sizes to this. We are using alpha. So I'll explain what alpha is. And then we are using a C map called plasma. I'll show you what that is also later on. So let me first execute this thing. So when I execute this, you can see that our first list is a representation of colors. So we have a color like 0 0.226012 and we have no idea what this color means. So this will get meaning only once we define something like CMAP. So CMAP is basically uh, the color map. That is where should this color be taken from? So within matplotlib, there are different names of color palettes. One of the color palettes is called as plasma, which as you see here, starts from this bluish color, changes its gradient slowly to something like yellowish. So I'm not defining, see in all these cases, I've not defined what color I need to plot. 
but I just give the color map. So this makes our job a bit easier. Once you give the color map, now on this color map, different numbers represent different values. So 0.22 here represents something like this uh, violetest purplish shade. Okay, a number like 0.5 would represent this yellowish shade, and so on. Okay, so C map helps us to control color. S as sizes. So you see, we have different sizes here that controls the size of each of these circles, each of these blobs. Okay. So what we see is using the plt.scatter command, we are able to control the color and size of each of these scatter points, each of these data points, which is more interesting because now we can have a very uh, interesting plot. We can see how our plots change with time and so on. Okay. Additionally, uh, there is one more co component called as alpha. Uh, do any of you want to uh, uh, guess what alpha does? What does it control? Okay, let, let me go on. Color thickness, plasma scale numbers, uh, no. So I'll tell you what alpha does. So alpha controls something called as transparency. Okay. So you see here, I have an overlap between these two plots and even though there is an overlap, I can see the underlying plot. I can see that uh, this is over, this is under, and I can see uh, some shade of what is happening behind. Okay. It controls transparency. So let me change different values of alpha and show you. If I change alpha to zero and I execute, you can see that everything has become fully transparent. So if I'm able to see the background. I cannot see the dot. I cannot see the plot at all. If I change my alpha to one and I execute, you see all of this has become solid colors. There is no transparency. So this overlap here, I cannot see the underlying circle. If I change it to some number in between, let's say 0 0.7, 0 0.7 is more towards solid, less towards transparency. 0 0.5 is somewhere in between. So 50% transparency. It also gives me this, this light shade of color, which I think some people like, I like as well. Uh, these are pale colors. They look, they look very exciting to me. Okay. So we can control uh, using a scatter plot. We can control individual aspects of our plots. Okay. Let's go ahead. So here in this case, I will show you uh, what is the advantage of being able to control these multiple aspects. Uh, I am loading a data set called as the iris data set. Uh, iris data set is a commonly known uh, familiar data set among data scientists. This is specially used uh, when we want to demonstrate something on, on a random data like this. Okay. So I am loading this data set from a package called as scikit-learn, sklearn datasets. I am using something called as load iris. So once I call load iris, I get this variable iris and I can show you what this iris variable looks like and what it does. Okay. So we'll be looking in detail what scikit-learn is later on. Right now we're just importing this uh, data set from here. So when I look at iris, I write iris and execute. I can see that iris is actually a dictionary because it starts with a curly brace. There is a key, there is a colon and there is a value. So there is a key called as data and there are values. Then apart from that, I have key called as target, frame, target names, description. So this is interesting. Let, let me use description. So if I say DESCR and I execute this, I can see that the description has characters like slash n. Uh, from my experience, I know what slash n stands for. Slash n is the line break character. So it is basically giving me the print statement. So I can write print of iris DESCR description. That gives me a neat format here. So what is Iris data set? So Iris data set is basically an Iris branch data set. This data set consists of 150 instances. There are 50 instances of each of three classes. So there are three classes of 50 instances that gives me 150 data points. There are four numeric attributes which are predictive in nature. These four attributes are sepal length, sepal width, petal length and petal width. So these are so someone, uh, I think his name is given, uh, the creator, Mr. or 
the researcher, I think R. A. Fisher, has uh, meticulously taken three kinds of flowers called as Iris setosa, Iris versicolor, and Iris virginica. And for these flowers, he has measured the sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. Let me quickly show you. Okay. So I hope you are able to let me try to expand this. Okay. So you can see these are the three different kinds of flowers. Uh, versicolor, setosa, and uh, virginica all belong to the iris gene. This is a sepal. This is a petal. And what that guy has done is he has measured the sepal width and sepal length, petal width and petal length for 50 of these versicolor flowers, 50 of setosa, and 50 of virginica. Okay. After measuring those, we have that information in centimeters for as our data point. Okay. So there's many much. This is a very common data set used for many papers. So we'll not go into all that. Let me look at the shape. So there are 150 uh, data points with four columns. This is what our target looks like. Let me delete this. We have already seen that. Okay. And finally, this is what our data looks like. So I'm taking the first 10 values of our data. In what way it helps us? Oh, uh, uh, this experiment, I, I think it's just a demonstration that we can train a machine learning algorithm to identify between flowers. The same uh, concept can be extended further to look at an MRI and identify what stage of cancer someone has. So it's just an helping way to help to train machine learning algorithms. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead. We see uh, here are 10 rows. So these are the four columns and we can see different values here. Now looking at these values or looking at these data points, it is very difficult for us to understand what these features are, how they are distributed in, in what way we can, uh, uh, we can see what is the pattern between these four features and the, and the class. Okay. So, what we can do is now, instead of visual or reading these numbers, we can put them on a plot. And a plot like this helps us to see what is happening. So let me show you what plot I'm creating. So I'm taking the four features uh, into this variable features. And I have feature names. And here I'm using plt.scatter. So I'm using a scatter plot. On the x-axis, we are putting feature zero. Feature zero is sepal length. So on the x-axis, you're putting sepal length. On the y-axis, we are putting features one, which is sepal width. We are giving alpha of 0.5. That is when they overlap, we should be able to see what is happening underneath. Size, we are controlling by feature three. So feature three is what? Petal length. So the different size of the data points represent the petal length of the, of the flowers. Okay. C is the class, is the color. So the color of our, uh, of our data point, we are deciding based on target. So we, there are three targets, right? Zero, one, and two. Zero stands for, uh, I think, let me look at target names. Zero stands for setosa, one stands for versicolor, and two stands for virginica. Okay. And these will be the three colors that we use for setosa, versicolor, and virginica. Okay. That is our colors and our color map is coming from a different uh, palette called as Viridis. So Viridis palette starts again in this shape. Okay. So now when I run this scatter command, we can observe this data and we can say, oh, excellent. If I draw a line like this, I can separate this flower from all the others. It is from this view, it is difficult to separate between uh, this blue and yellow classes. But this purple class, I can easily separate by writing, by writing, by putting a line here. Okay. But now CC, let, we have four features and we have only three dimensions. Uh, in fact, can you tell me how many dimensions is this plot? Is it two dimension, one dimension, three dimension, four, five, six? How many dimensions is this plot? 
okay 2d anyone else three d okay two d okay so many people two d many people three d uh, I have not got the right answer yet okay let me tell you yes now excellent del okay so someone named del and manasa now they are writing the right so this is a four dimensional plot okay so interestingly normally people would say two dimensions because i have an x coordinate i have a y coordinate these are four dimensions because we we have x axis y axis we have color which is the third dimension and we have size which is the fourth dimension okay so x axis y axis color and size using these four values we are using four dimensions to plot this form data okay now one thing with data sciences uh, uh, we generally struggle with visualizing things in higher dimensions so this color and size helps us to see more things okay let me change uh, we have not used feature 4 let me put feature 4 on the x axis so when i put feature 4 on the x axis and i execute so okay so feature 4 will be 3 so 0 1 2 we have not used 2 let me write 2 and execute so now we can see in a different frame so if on the x axis i put petal length instead of sepal length i can see a more a more prominent uh, display this line can separate this one i can draw a line like here which will work out very well it may not be 100% accurate but it will be accurate maybe 80 or 90% of the time so we can do that only because we are able to visualize this data okay and uh, data science requires lot of interesting visualizations visualizations help us to see how how uh, our data is distributed what we can do interestingly with our data let me show you one amazing visualization okay which i think is very relevant in this times so most of us are following how covid is increasing so you see this map here this is a lovely representation okay uh, the on the coordinates we have the map of india and then we have different sizes of circles the different size of the x coordinate y coordinate of the circle so shows the place where it has where we are trying to measure what has happened and the size of the circle gives us an idea of uh, the number of people infected you see that all of these circles also have an alpha value because of which we are able to go down and we are able to see uh, we are able to see that within a bigger space smaller spaces how things are affected okay so a very interesting visualization uh, and uh, we use data science for getting this stuff right even these plots you see these visualizations these are line plots and they uh, this is this is actually a, a, a well formed dashboard uh, that helps us to see in live how things are happening and our hope is that through our learning of matplotlet seaborn and stuff like that some day we will we will reach to that level of visualization that we can do this and these are actually very simple to do they're not very complicated but we will keep our discussion limited to smaller things our our journey does not end at visualization visualization is another st stepping stone we need to reach towards machine learning data science and so on okay so with this we will stop for today in tomorrow's class i will i will finish some more kinds of plots like histograms i think that's the last part histogram and then we'll do matplotlib seaborn so let's do that tomorrow we'll stop for today let me stop sharing okay nija ma'am uh, i will exit now okay <clears throat>